Well, it's my pleasure to be with all of you, and I would like to thank the Bonston Institute, Bonston Institute Chairman, Vice Chairman, and all the officers. It's a joy to be here and share with you in the good things of the Lord. We had a delightful time. I trust you did, hearing about the life of Greg. He was uh, a great brother in the Lord. And now let's think a little bit about um, what you could call, well, the address is in some ways to be the continued need for and usefulness of Bonson's apologetic, and that's certainly what I will intend to address. Uh, but I also think of it particularly in terms of the genius of Greg's, Greg Bonson's apologetics. What particularly marked Greg as an apologist? And I'd like to begin uh, by reading a passage of Scripture uh, from 1 Corinthians 2. You may be familiar uh, with this particularly uh, as if you've ever heard the memorial service uh, for Dr. Van Til, Richard Gaffin spoke and used this passage uh, for that purpose. And Richard Gaffin wrote an important article that was published in the Westminster Journal uh, for the first time in the 1995 uh, volume honoring uh, the 100th year of Dr. Van Til's birth. Greg had the first article uh, which was a kind of pricey of his dissertation on self-deception. Uh, and uh, Dick, or Dick Gaffin, Richard Gaffin, uh, had an article particularly uh, saying that Dr. Bonson's, um, his, his approach uh, was exegetically based out of 1 Corinthians 2. Uh, Burkauer in the Festschrift Jerusalem in Athens had criticized Dr. Van Til for not being explicitly exegetical enough too philosophical and not explicitly exegetical. And Dr. Ventil, in his, his typically humble way, said, well, perhaps you have a point. Although my exegesis, I would point to the Westminster Old Testament Department and the new, you know, John Murray. I agree with his exegesis. Um, but he was humble in this respect. And Gaffin responded to say, I think he was a little too humble. I think that the scriptures were so fundamental for what he did that they were not always clearly exposed as such. And so Gaffet in that article says a real foundation for the Vantillian apologetic is 1 Corinthians 2. And of course, that would also apply to Greg. Paul says by the Spirit, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Yet among the mature we do, not, we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love Him, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thought except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now we've received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the spirit of God. They're folly to him. He is not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. Spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who's understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Well, there are many other scriptures that I would like to read to you that we'll reference here or there, but I'm going to leave it here for now. And let me just start in the kind of way that I think Dr. Bonson, and I'm going to call him that or Greg. I knew him, uh, so I think it sounds a little friendlier to call him Greg. He would be happy with that. You need first, when you talk to unbelievers, to do so realizing that you do not have common ground with them on the question of epistemology or how we know what we know. 
that's just the sort of thing that Greg Bonson loved to explain and drive home to regular folks at conferences titled Taking It to the Streets or Getting Down and Dirty in Apologetics. Dr. Van Til was a great man, but he never had titles like that. <laughs> that was not quite his style. Greg was, more than anybody I've known, a man of great and capacious abilities intellectually, but yet who had a passion and really could make this known to the man or woman in the pew. That was his desire, um, non pareil. And so that kind of, I've heard in my own uh, talking to people, I've been around the country quite a bit, and people who have had this contact with Greg, and they often uh, don't simply say, oh, he was a great scholar and all that, though, though certainly he was, and that may have struck them also, but his personal warmth and his love and care and his desire for God's people to be all that they were to be by way of sanctification in God. That was really what comes through. Well, Cornelius Van Til was his primary source, of course, after Jesus and Paul and the whole rest of Scripture. But I did have a, a, a student uh, a few years back write a, 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 a paper for Intro to Apologetics that was just fantastic. And it was an encounter with Buddhism, and he fairly represented Buddhism. It was, it was really one of the very best papers I have ever read. Uh, and I, I especially appreciated his, one of his early footnotes where he said, I use here the method of Paul. And then he said, also known as presuppositional method, as practiced by Van Til. And, but I like the way that he put that. I'm, I'm, I'm using Paul because I do teach quite a bit out of Acts to show here's, we want to be biblical. And Greg wanted to be biblical. And Dr. Van Til wanted to be. So we could say Van Til in the tradition, notice this, of Abraham Kuyper, on the one hand especially, and O. Princeton. Now, let me say this. Dr. Van Til combined the best of both of these. Kuyper had a very strong a notion, a strong notion of antithesis. And Warfield, as representative, you might say, of O. o. Princeton, would say we can do apologetics because all are in the image of God. He made an appeal to right reason. Now, that approach of Princeton, this Scottish common sense approach, had, I think, some rationalistic deficiencies, but I also think it's been seen in a better light. It's not just untrammeled rationalism made clear in a recent paradigm shift, you might say. Uh, people like Paul Helseth, David Smith, and others, I have some significant agreement with that. That's a development of the last couple of decades that comes after Greg's life and work. But Greg always would say that. He would say, I appreciate Kuiper because of the antithesis. But of course, in theory, Kuiper says we can't do apologetics. I trust you know that. Kuiper says, well, it's just you have, you have Christian, a Christian approach to science and you have an unbelieving approach. You have these two streams. Although Kuiper, thankfully, is not consistent in that. I mean, you can read in his works. For example, he engages Islam. And he does apologetics. <laughs> but we need that strong antithesis. But we also need Princeton saying, no, we can engage people. We can do this apologetics. And so Greg and Ventil stood very much at that juncture. Greg brought Cornelius Ventil and presuppositionalism, which is a transcendental approach that looks for the necessary preconditions of all knowledge, down to a level that not only the philosophically informed, but all believers could grapple with. Here we, we see this. I, I was a part of it in conferences like taking it to the streets. We had him out for several conferences. Uh, I was at, uh, involved with some other churches in these conferences. And I think we see here, to begin with, we might say, the unmatched usefulness of Bonson's approach and the continued need for it more than ever, I would argue. Unbelievers in denying God deny revelation. And I don't know if you got how I was emphasizing that from the reading. Revelation. Everything depends on it. And unbelievers deny that, both general and special. Now, you all know that unbelievers deny the Bible. That's part of what makes them unbelievers. They certainly deny that it's the Word of God, inspired, infallible, inerrant. Thus, the unregenerate have to account for how they know what they know through something other than general 
and special revelation. So they think they know what they know through something else other than general and special revelation, although everything they know, they know it through that. But they're not epistemologically self-conscious. They're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. There's a million things we can say about that, and rightly so. The Bible is really clear about this. Well, the unregenerate have to account for it in some other way. And we as believers, we understand that we know God and all things through revelation. More on this in a minute. Not so with unbelievers. They believe that they know things through one of two main ways. Through evidence in some fashion, some sort of evidentialism, some sort of empiricism, that's all the same thing. Or through the use of reason, some sort of rationalism. And then there are combinations of this. The scientific method is seeking to combine reason bringing it to bear on evidence. That's part of what the scientific method is. 1 Corinthians 2.9 makes it clear that these two ways don't only not tell us about God, but also in themselves don't tell us about anything with clarity or certainty. Look at verse 9. What no eye has seen nor ear heard, empiricism evidentialism. That's talking about the senses, what you can gather through the senses. Nor the heart of man imagine. And remember, biblically, the heart of man is not talking about simply the emotions. It's talking about the whole of the inner man. It would include the head and the, the affections and the will. It would include all of that, the, the inner man. And so it's not what we can see or smell or touch or taste, those things, nor uh, is it uh, simply by our own reasoning. That's not the ultimate answer to how we know what we know. Unbelievers, um, according to this 1 Corinthians 2.9 then, thinks that one knows in and of himself autonomously, either by empiricism, that is to say the use of evidence, by sense experience, seeing, hearing, smelling, touching, tasting, as Aristotle taught, and Hume, David Hume especially, brought, you might say, to its proper conclusion showing that it gives us no sure knowledge. If you want to be an empiricist, you really have to, to read Hume and see where empiricism goes. It goes into the ditch. It goes into what we call solipsism. All you can ultimately know are the impressions that are in your head because Locke said you can't know the thing in itself and Barclay said, yes, that's right. We can only know our, our perception of things, our, our sense of things, uh, to, to be is to be perceived. And Hume says, well, I'll go you one better than that. We can't know what our perceptions have to do with anything called reality. We can only know what we have in our own head. And he's not wrong. He's not wrong if that's simply all there is. If there is no God, if there's no vertical, there's just the horizontal. We could call this a look and see method. This look and see method only tells us something that we know in our own heads, nothing about the real world or that we can know it's telling us about the real world. Certainty of all, every sort is destroyed. And philosophers of all sorts, philosophers of all sorts, led by Hume, recognize this to be the case. This is what threw Immanuel Kant into a tizzy. He said, Hume awakened me from my dogmatic slumbers. Kant realized that Hume's project imperiled all knowledge. It imperiled scientific knowledge. It imperiled religious knowledge. So Kant says, well, let's put it up here. Let's put the metaphysics up here in the noumenal. And he can't get at that. And the phenomenal, that's public knowledge we can all agree on, observe facts. We'll put that in the lower story. And man has always done that sort of thing. He's either gone with some sort of empiricism, some sort of rationalism, or he's made the kind of move that Aristotle makes, you know, with, with trying to bring the world of forms, the Platonic world, down into matter itself. Kant does the same sort of thing. You could think he puts Descartes and his rationalism up here and he's got uh, Humean uh, empiricism down here and then Hegel says, let me bring that down. Let me immunitize the absolute. Let me bring the noumenal down into the phenomenal. And if you, the whole history of philosophy 
is this train wreck of the one in the many. I wish we had a lot more time to talk about this. But Ventel talks about it. Um, a lot of people talk about it. Bonson certainly talked about it uh, in his conferences. Rush Dooney talks about it. A lot of people talk about, helpfully, the one in the many because it's the great central problem in Western philosophy. But, you know, that one can easily lose people. Their eyes glaze over. If you have a few more minutes, you can explain it. You can show them how they... I've, I've tried to write on this. I, I remember writing once for Tom Tyson in New Horizon, and he was wanting me to explain some of this. And I really was laboring... I mean, he, he thought it was okay, and others have told me they thought it was okay, but I so labored over that article, I remember it, because Tom told me, you cannot use epistemology, you can't use a single word of, and I'm like, I'm my dear wife, you know, she is really, she's so helpful, and I'm laboring there, and I'm figuring, huh, and she's like, what's wrong? And I'm like, I'm laboring over this, can't use any of the language. And she's a faithful wife. Instead of saying, I feel very sorry for you, because I always have enough sorrow for myself to go around. I, I, I'm, I'm a master of self-pity, so I actually don't need people around me to help me with that. I'm, I'm good at it. Uh, very practiced. And so my wife said, well, if you really understand it, you don't have to use that jargon. She was right. I was right. I was, thank you, dear. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, like if you understand it, you can put it in other words. And Greg was so good at that. He really was. I commend his, his work to you in that sense. So there's the empiricism of the, of the sense experience. There's the rationalism. You can call, I'm trying to be simple here, a look and see method, that's empiricism. A stop and think method, that's rationalism. That's Plato. Plato says the world, you look and see, this takes you further away from the truth. The truth is unseen. It's in the unseen world of the forms where, where you have tableness. And, and every table is an instantiation of this tableness, more or less. But it actually takes you away from the truth. You want to you wanna think about that in this world. And there's... You know, again, if this is the first time that you've heard about Plato, you're saying that's ridiculous. But actually, it's, it's, he's trying to solve some problems. He's trying to figure out how Parmenides could talk about being and Heraclitus could talk about becoming and how you put them together. And that's sort of what he's doing. His world of, his world of forms is Parmenides. I don't mean the cheese. That's something else. Uh, and then the, 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 the world of, of action, Heraclitus, everything is, is in flux. Um, Greg had an incomparable way of explaining this, both in conferences and debates, particularly, and we've heard about this, particularly in the legendary debate that he had in 1985 at UC Irvine with Gordon Stein. You may recall, I, I trust everybody here has heard that debate. I mean, I, I, we always hear it as, you know, and I, I'm kind of like, I, I kid the students because I know the dialogue in it pretty well. So it's not, you know, it's not like, you know, Rocky Horror Picture Show. I mean, we're going to come and, you know, throw popcorn while we hear it. But uh, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's a fantastic debate. And um, they're talking about Stein, of course, as a materialist. He's an anti-theistic, naturalistic materialist. And he can only understand anything in terms of material. Of course, the scientific method itself isn't material. No scientist can account for his own method. But Stein doesn't get any of this. Because scientists are the worst at this often. I mean, you read, you read The Grand Design of Hawkins, his, his last big book, and, and he starts off by saying, philosophy is dead! He starts the book off that way, and then he goes on to do philosophy because, I mean, he's, he's talking about the st string theory in multiverse, and I'm telling you, I mean, something for which there is no evidence, none, that there are multiple dimensions and multiple universes. The reason that they do that, really, the reason that they came to those theories, they had them in seed forms, but they came to them more hardly because intelligent design people had so made the fine-tuning arguments. And they always tried to refute the fine-tuning arguments till they realized, well, they're right. If the initial constants at the beginning of the universe, if, if the universe weren't constructed in a way that appears incredibly detailedly designed, if it weren't that way, everything we know as it exists wouldn't exist. And they sort of said, okay, here's here, ah, we figure out a way to get around that. There are potential billions, trillions of worlds, and this is the one in which that happened. No evidence for it, right? The, the evidence is that there's no evidence. That even gets argued. But um, so there's Stein. He's a materialist. And he says, he's, he thinks he's got Bonson in, in questions on the horns of a dilemma. Is God immaterial? Well, yeah, God is a spirit. What is, you know, what is immaterial? Not extended in space. Is anything else immaterial? And he's been using laws of logic and talking about it. And he says laws of logic. 
and you remember the audience breaks out. Um, just classic. That's classic. If the first distinctive of Greg's contribution to apologetics is approachability for the common man, and, and I'm just kind of cheating off of, we didn't, I didn't look at what Roger said, but he said that more or less, but I'm trying to give you a little bit about that. The second might be unequal debate skills in speaking boldly and clearly to the necessary and indispensable Christian theistic foundations to all the disciplines of the university. Some, the reason I have to look at these notes some is because if I don't, we'll be here all night. My wife said, look at, she said, look at your notes. Read from your notes. <laughs> yeah. Something secularist professors know they know that there are Christian, there are foundations to their disciplines that are of the matter or of the nature of faith. Yes, they do. Thomas Kuhn in the structure of scientific revolutions actually says that. That's probably the most important secular book on the whole question of the history of science and the philosophy of science. Many, many have said who have been polled, uh, what is the most important book of the 20th century? Secularists. And the top book, they said, was, was Kuhn, Structure of Scientific Revolution. But I was a little bit closer to when it got popular, and the scientists all hated that book. Because part of what the book says is science is just not this objective, true thing. It's got all kinds of biases and interests and, you know, and this is before anybody knew about Dr. Fauci and so forth. But so, um, yeah, but I mean, you know, that's, that's been interesting because a lot of people have said, well, in a postmodern era, I've, I've, t I've told people all the time, the scientists still take this approach, and a lot of people do. They think postmodernism has destroyed this. Well, it does go against it. And postmodernism will say there's no neutrality. They're all biases. They say all of that. And I was talking to some people. I said, yes, but you see what's just happened in the last few years? The talking heads are saying science says. So don't think that's gone by the board. It hasn't. It hasn't gone by the board. And what this science, and this person actually actually heard the person I mentioned at one point say he embodied science. That was, you know, I know Jesus embodied the truth. He is the truth incarnate. But this man said he was science incarnate. That's just really silly. And, and Thomas Kuhn would say, what? <laughs> you know, I'm a professor at MIT and I know better than that. Um, but Greg knew this so well, and we had a very active um, ministry. I was a local pastor in South Jersey and was, by God's grace, able to start a very active on-campus ministry at a local state university called the Student Bible Ministry. And um, we chose the name very carefully because we wanted it. We, our focus was students. We Reform, we did some polling. You, and I'm as reformed as they come. You don't want the name reformed. It's a state university. They, didn't, they thought that meant reform school. They didn't understand what that meant. And ministry, we wanted to minister. So we said Bible because we're going to be doing this from the Bible. Student Bible ministry. you got to be smart about these things. You don't go in there and you know, say, we're the 1643 Presbyterians. These people would have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> None. But at any rate, I, we worked a lot on the campus. We did a lot of things. Um, I tried, I did, we published a regular newsletter. I had a column. You got to get the first shot in. So it was called Strange But True. I mean, especially when you have a name like this, you got to get the first shot in. Strange But True. Um, so we, we got Greg to the campus and I really tried to get a debate with some different professors who were very opposed uh, to the faith in a very, very virulent way. And none of, one of them said, uh, debate? No, it's over and you lost. That was the response. So what we got, Greg, you can go on uh, Sermon Audio. All this stuff, thanks to all our good friends, have been made so available. And that one has a title about what your professors really know but are afraid to tell you. And he went through every department and showed that the secular anti-theistic presuppositions destroy the department. Nothing they do coheres. Nothing they do makes sense. That without the self-attesting Christ of Scripture and the ontological tr trinity, all of this is reduced to nonsense. And he did it beautifully. And there was this one professor, there were several professors there, and this one who was really opposed to him, and I had debated him before. His name was Professor Grace, and he had none. Uh, he, was a religion, he was a religion professor, and, and he, he paced in the back of the room the whole time. But he was one of these fellows who had gone, I think he had gone to BJU. Kind of like Bart Erdman. He went, when he went Moody and, and, and Wheaton, and, but he went to BJU. And then, shh, 
went to liberal places. And so he was in fundamentalism. And now he's just way over here, totally denying the faith. Uh, nice, you know, state university, nice chair of religion. You know, that's, they're happy to have him. Um, so they wouldn't debate him there as elsewhere. Michael Martin, anyone? Um, but he took them on regardless. So back to the point of Greg's clear apologetic exposition. For unbelievers, some combination of empiricism, rationalism, supposedly explains how we know what we know. Sadly also for those who are evidentialists or classicists apologetically. They're falling into the, existent, the, the, the empiricism or the rationalism trap. Unbelievers reject that we know what we know uh, by revelation. We understand that. In fact, though, according to 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. Now, Greg, when you would say that, when Greg would say that, he pressed this point a lot. Natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. And Greg was used to this objection coming even from Christians, from evidentialists and classicists. But, Dr. Bonson, this refers only to spiritual things and not natural things. They can't know spiritual things. They can know natural things. But there are no brute facts, which means there are no merely natural things unconnected to the supernatural. Nothing in this world is autonomous from God. All autonomy and neutrality is pretended. It's pretended. It's not real. Every created fact witnesses to its creator. This is God's world. And all natural things, Psalm 19, Romans 1 externally, Romans 2 internally, witness and conscience, points to the supernatural and finds their true meaning as being part of the world made by God. Taken by themselves, they just don't make any sense because you're back to the empiricism and rationalism trap. Again, notice that the Spirit then, verse 10, searches everything. Everything. Panta. I'll use a little Greek there since Roger didn't. Everything in the world relates to its maker. We know only what we know. And here we differ from the unbeliever and our conscience and joyful confession of such. And sadly, some Christians who aren't up to snuff on this, we know what we know only because God has revealed it to us. Believers believe the ultimate source of knowledge is neither our senses, notice what I'm saying, ultimate, neither our senses nor our mind, but external to us, a revelation of the God who is there. Now, Schaefer said that. Schaefer was an inconsistent presuppositionalist. He did some helpful things. He was my, I remember I was an undergraduate and I had given this paper. I knew nothing. I'd been studying philosophy, history, a number of things. I knew nothing. I didn't know the name Ventil. I didn't, I was a, I was a Reformed Baptist. I didn't know Westminster Seminary. And I was at this conference and a man came up and said, do you know Francis Schaeffer? Have you read him? And I said, I don't know who he is. And he, he said, go read the God who is there. You're, you're, you're talking like he's talking. And I read the God who is there. Like I got it in the library like at 11 o'clock and I stayed up all night reading it. And I was like, yes, there was something there, but I had the sense of this doesn't go far enough. He, I remember he talked to the line of despair as you're with Kant and Hegel. And I'm thinking, but this, you're talking about something that goes back to the garden. It's not something we need to get back to a Greek. He was sort of almost like saying you need to get back to this Greek. Uh, we've had a dialectic and we need to get back to an antithetical way of thinking. And I'm thinking, well, that goes back to the garden. Where, where, as Luther said, you know, man stood zwischen Gott und Teufel, between God and the devil, and acted as judge, which he shouldn't have done, right? He should have just believed God. God said it, that settles it. Or also the rationalist Gordon Clark. So I'm just pointing out, there are other people who call themselves presuppositionalists. Those would be two big ones. Uh, and he would have more problems with Gordon Clark. And I have a lot of things in print where I take... A brother Clark to task about this or that. And I get letters from his few followers always. Um, in natural, general revelation, and in scripture, special revelation, we know what we know because God has shown it to us. The law is known in a measure through general revelation, so says Romans 2 and elsewhere. The gospel is known, however, only and exclusively through special revelation. We only know the gospel through special revelation, through the Word of God. Now, general revelation, let me say this. Romans 1, it'd be good to take and read that, but I think you know Romans 1 pretty well, 18 and 30 to 32. 
Romans 1 makes it clear that the knowledge of God is made certain to everyone. It's not made possible. This is, this is one of the great problems with Aquinas. So our good friends who are saying we need to, we need to engage in the ressourcement uh, of, of Aquinas, we need to recapture this, are missing some very basic things that are problematic uh, in Aquinas. Uh, can we learn things from Aquinas? We can learn things from Balaam's ass. I mean, uh, yes, of course there are things to learn from Aquinas, but there's plenty that I want to take issue with, not only soterically, obviously Aquinas is deficient soterically and in other ways, but he's deficient epistemically. Because if you read him, take Romans 1, his whole approach, let me try to get this here, uh, or we'll be on this forever. Bonson and, 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 and Ventil are often accused in their criticizing of Aquinas' five proofs. Remember Aquinas, the five ways, motion, causality, necessity, gradation, and teleology, all with reason leading, I, I draw all this stuff on the board, you know, re, reason leading to the vestibule of faith. So he believes that fallen sinful man is not totally depraved. He doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't believe in noetic effects of sin, which right there, I'm like, how are Reformed people thinking this is great? Uh, what am I missing here? I, I, I must have missed a memo or something. I don't get this. So, so you can reason your way. Your man is able to reason his way. Now, yes, he needs God's grace and he needs faith and he needs that to, to go forward. Um, but what he teaches there is that through, this, through these proofs, um, you can come to know God in a kind of naturalistic way. But the thing that Romans 1 says is that every unbeliever knows God, not savingly. But he knows God and he suppresses the truth and unrighteousness. And even you go down to 32 and it says he knows what's decreed by God. It's like this isn't some possibility of knowledge. This is knowledge. And man, you say, well, what do you, how does this work? How is he suppressing it? Well, let's just think about the four huge figures at the end of the 19th coming into the 20th century. Carl Truman's written a lot about these guys lately, very helpfully. Uh, but Darwin, Marx, Carl, I mean, the least funny of the Marx brothers. No, I prefer Groucho, but Darwin, Marx, um, Nietzsche, and Freud. They've cast a huge shadow on us all, and they are magnificent structures built to suppress truth. They're supp I mean, they're fools who build on the sand as opposed to the wise who build on the rock. But you know what? You can build grand castles on the sand. And I, I, I figure my house on the rock given who I am, is pr probably pretty shabby in many respects, but it's on the rock. You know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm barely holding on. I'm, you know, if you know what I mean. I, it's, it's, I mean, no, no, I always, one of the best points Greg ever made was this, and this is, oh, this is so Greg. This is not the problem. This is the problem. The greatest apologetic challenge is not this. This is the Word of God. It's inspired, it's infallible, it's inerrant. This, I'm the greatest apologetical challenge. My own lack of consistency with everything that's here. And Greg was, Greg was so clear on that always. He was, to me, so clear on all of these things. Well, the unregenerate can't account for, it's also Greg and... Is, is charged with saying uh, that fallen man can know or do nothing in any sense. That's never what's said. It's what the claim is, is that man, unregenerate man can't account for or justify any knowledge as fallen. But fallen unregenerate man does not have the truth held out as a possibility, as we say, but is in touch with it at every point, suppressing it. This general revelation is infallible as is special. I know students always look when you say that. It's as infallible. Yes, there's no error in it. We make error in, and people say, but people don't rightly interpret it. And then I say, oh, you're right, but people never make that mistake with Scripture. <laughs> Wrongly interpreting it doesn't mean that it's not infallible. It is, but of course, we're in rebellion and we worship the creature rather than the Creator. Uh, and that's why we misinterpret it fundamentally. And here we get one of Greg's greatest insights. This is a more scholarly insight as expressed in his USC dissertation mentioned earlier. A conditional resolution of the apparent paradox of self-deception. And that 1995 um, volume of the Westminster Journal, the spring 1995, where Greg is about a 30, 31 page, pray see, 
uh, it's a if the dissertation is is technical philosophically if you've not studied that but if you read that particular article which I, has that been published again it certainly should be that's something you all should have out there maybe it is out there uh, but I know it's I know it's in the journal it's, it's excellent just let me say this we all know psychologically that there's such a thing as self-deception right but how do we account for it philosophically how can one actively do something and not know he's doing it wouldn't someone deceiving himself know it and thus not actually be deceived Greg gave a brilliant treatment to this, a very important question for apologetics, as it helps us to understand, this wasn't something, I mean, Van Til would say suppressing the truth and unrighteousness, but this is a, the, a bounce and corollary that's, I think, very insightful. And I've had, I have a friend who is a, who is a, a, a Christian, been a Christian counselor for years, uh, you know, Brother Mallon, and uh, he will still say, I asked him, what's one of the best things you ever heard in counseling? Because he's been through all the CCF stuff. He's, he's, you know, and he said, Greg Bonson, when he came and gave these two lectures on self-deception, he said, because that's sort of form, because that's what you're, I mean, he says nine-tenths of what I'm doing in counseling, whether with believers or, or even now, and I'm, I'm, I'm apolo dealing apologetically with unbelievers. It has to do with self-deception. Um, so it helps us, Greg's, thesis helps us to understand how someone can know the truth of God's existence, yet truly deceive himself, suppressing the truth and unrighteousness, acting as if he doesn't know the truth that he's always denying through suppression. And here's a quote. Self-deception involves an indefensible belief about one's beliefs. That is, S perpetrates a deception on himself when because of the distressing nature of some belief held by him, he's, he's motivated to misconstrue the relevant evidence in a matter and comes to believe that he does not hold that belief, although he does. When he holds a belief that is discomforting, the self-deceiver simultaneously brings himself to believe that he does not hold it. And toward the end of maintaining that unwarranted second order belief, he presses into service distorted and strained reasoning regarding the evidence which is averse to his desires. He not only hides from himself his disapprobated belief, but when he purposely engages in self-deception, he hides the hiding of that belief as well. And this is good stuff. So in regards to the epistemology of unbelievers, they believe that they know what they know by a stop and think method. That's what they think. By a look and see method, that's what they think. But such naturalistic approaches will never yield the supernatural. They'll never lead to God. And these grand truth suppressing systems that I mentioned of Darwin and so forth, um, these are, are mechanisms of that suppression. Unbelievers locked in naturalism can't account for science, which is a theoretical construct, not something one gets if... If, if your theory is what you see is what you get, you don't get science, then you never get, you, don't, you can't have science. Therefore, Plantinga is right here. I have a lot of criticism of Plantinga, but his more recent book, Where the Conflict Really Lies, is correct. The real conflict is not, as is often supposed, between faith and science. This is the best treatment of that, but between unbelief and science. It's not between faith and science. There's a, there's a supposed you know, tension between faith and science. But no, there's not. It's between unbelief and science. Unbelief destroys the possibility of science. Greg showed this brilliantly time and again, particularly against Stein and, and some others. Unbelievers, though brilliant as Einstein, proximately. God's common grace permits this. It both restrains sin and affords many natural gifts. They know many things here below. Notice how I put it. Unbelievers can be brilliant and know many, many things proximately. They can be magnificent scientists, artists, writers, composers, chefs, ballplayers, architects. Again, Van Til and Bonson get accused of denying this. That's silly. They don't deny this. But they don't know those brilliant people who deny Jesus don't know one single thing ultimately. Nothing. So, our catechized children know ultimately more than the most brilliant worldly who denies God. You say, but you're saying then they can't account for things that are, that are not material. They, they can't account for love and beauty and logic and science. Yes, they may and do believe in them, but they do so by, wait for it, and I always thought this was very kind of Ventil. And Greg would say the same thing, borrowing from my worldview. I say in my class, stealing, because I, I don't give them permission. 
I, it seems like stealing to me from our worldview. They can't explain or understand based on their unbelieving worldview how any of this is possible. This is why always and everywhere, and here's the thesis of Van Til and of Greg. Greg would always hold this forward as the thesis. Anti-theism presupposes theism. That's the thesis. Anti-theism presupposes theism. This was Van Til's thesis, brilliantly and consistently applied everywhere by Greg. I think John Meather is right that Van Til's approach is just consistent Calvinism. He's saying let's be Calvinists not only soterically but epistemically. And that's what Greg was seeking to do. Speaking to the person in the pew, debating brilliantly and advancing scholarship, particularly with a seminal work on self-deception. We need, and he would have done a lot more in scholarship, but he had such a, he had such a burden for the person in the pew. And, well, we say that he lived too short, but God's perfect. So there really is no such thing as that. He makes no mistakes. We need to realize that unbelievers then, lacking epistemological common ground on the question of knowing with believers, need to be regenerated. They need to see things as things need to be seen rightly so that they might be understood. Does this mean then that you can't talk to unbelievers unless until they're born again? As I said, Kuiper in, in theory almost has that approach, but thankfully not in practice. And Greg's answer would be no. The necessity of regeneration for true understanding, that's certainly what 1 Corinthians 2 is saying. You must be born again to truly understand. Does not mean that we have nothing to say to unbelievers, but it does mean that you should not expect them to understand you if you seek to speak to them based on some common ground of how you know what you know. The kind of common ground assumed by the myth of neutrality. There is no neutrality. We're either for or against God. That goes all the way back to the garden. Especially it means that you shouldn't let unbelievers set the plate for the common ground of your communication with them which would be either empiricism or rationalism, which never get you the mind of Christ, verse 16, the mind that everyone needs to have to believe Him and believe in Him. Naturalism never yields a supernatural belief. Greg would say this sort of thing all the time. He would say he was great at illustrating. This was part of his getting the point across. He would say, you can't get to Houston by boarding a plane for Denver. You know, he says, if you, get, if you, if you are, are arguing with an unbeliever and you're arguing empirically, you're arguing rationally, rationalistically, uh, and you get off the plane, it was a plane to Denver, you shouldn't get off in Denver and say, how come we're not in Houston? Because the plane you got on is going to take you there and it gets you in that kind of mess. And again, uh, the great illustration of that is the Stein debate. I say that, I mean... I could talk a lot more about other debates as well, but I think everybody knows that one. And Gordon Stein didn't know what had hit him in that debate. It's very clear. And it'd be, it'd be fun to talk about the aftermath of the debate. I remember when Greg told me all about the aftermath, and, and it becomes it, 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 that was a fascinating thing. That's another t story for another time. Um, so how are we to speak to them if there's, no, if there's no neutrality, no place where our ultimate commitments don't come into play as they as they always do, both for believers and unbelievers. We do have common ground, but at the level of being, not knowing. Our common ground is ontological, which is to say everywhere. This is our Father's world for all the like. Everybody lives in this world that God has made. For believers, we have the mind of Christ. And that conditions how we see everything in the world, verses 12 and 13, especially 15. And this sheds light on the meaning of verse 2. Notice back in verse 2, Paul says, I've decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That could sound like a very odd sort of statement, like a, a, some kind of a Gnostic, super spiritual, platonic statement. If you come up to him and you say, you know, my Aunt Sadie has cancer or Uncle Cousin Bill just had a stroke. Christ and Him crucified! I wouldn't hear about that. I mean, you know, is that what that means? you you, you got to come to passages and wrestle. Well, what, what does this mean? What does this mean? And... The resolve to know nothing but Christ and Him crucified is a determination. It is a kind of narrowing here. It's a narrowing. It's a narrowing. It's almost like a single lens focus. Single lens focus. And you're going to say, I'm, I know nothing but Christ and Him crucified. And it's a determination to know everything through that lens through which you view all reality. You see everything through the lens of Christ and Him crucified. That's a, that's a synecdoche, not the city of New York but a part of speech, uh, a part for the whole. So Christ and Him crucified is speaking about the person and work of Christ. 
And you're determined. Paul is resolved to see everything through that lens. Everything will be seen through that lens, which is a proper spiritual and not merely natural lens. Well, how do we talk to an unbeliever since they're lacking such a spiritual lens? And Greg offered great insight here, and I wish I had more time on this, but his comments on Proverbs 26, 4 and 5 are really helpful because you have that strange saying there, cheek to jowl, you know, uh, answer a fool according to his folly. Answer not a fool according to his folly. And you have to, and it's conditioned uh, on the one hand, uh, lest he be wise in his own eyes, lest you be like him. And Greg applies this, uh, verse 4, answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him. This means don't answer the fool in terms of his naturalistic methods of empiricism or rationalism. You don't try to prove the resurrection or anything to him on naturalistic terms. Rather, you furnish him with a biblical answer to his objections. You can say something like this. I know that you don't see things as I do as a Christian. But this is how we as Christians see things. And we believe what we do, not based on naturalistic assumptions that can't account for themselves, but the revelation of God, the God who is there, we see according to truth. So come let us reason together on such biblical grounds. Again, I know you're saying, I don't believe that and so forth. Um, uh, I, I, but you're saying, for, for the sake of argument, just li let, me, let me tell you what the Christian answer is. Because, and then I'll come over into your world, verse 5, and look and see and I'll make sure I understand where you're really coming from. And I'll stand within your world view and say... Uh, wait a minute, this doesn't seem consistent. This doesn't seem coherent. This doesn't seem to quite make sense. And here's what's not happening. I'm not saying there's a neutral zone. I really need a chalkboard or a whiteboard for this. There's not a neutral zone here into which I'm saying you give up your presuppositions, unbelieving friend, and I'll give up my presuppositions and we'll go into the neutral zone. That sounds like an episode of Star Trek or something to me. You know, the good Kirk and the bad Kirk. I don't know what this is. But we'll both go into the neutral zone, all of which is just a fantasy. This thing doesn't exist. Nobody's giving up their presuppositions. I'm not asking you to give up your presuppositions because because you wouldn't be converted if you did. If you're really giving up your presuppositions, if you're adopting Christian ones, it's because God's Spirit has worked and you're converted. I can't do that in you, but I am saying, listen, this is how I reason on this as a Christian. And let me come over and, and figure out how you... And so we're not playing a game and we're not, we're not sprinting to a finish line to get them to pray a prayer and say, you're okay now. You prayed the sinner's prayer, go out there and, you know, maybe go to church sometime maybe. Uh, something like that. You know, I mean, there's, that's not what we're doing here. We're really seriously engaging people. Paul says, I plant another waters, God gives the increase. It's always only and ever God who gives the increase. That's what this whole approach recognizes, the utter need for the work of the Spirit of God. But this is a way that, that can be helpful because we're not asking the Christian to give up his presuppositions, uh, the, the non-Christian to give up. We, he's, he's not capable of it. But we'll come over. We can understand him. I mean, he, the, 1 Corinthians 2 says he doesn't understand us. We understand him because we've looked at life from both sides. Now, well, Seriously. We understand the flesh and we understand life in the Spirit. He doesn't understand life in the Spirit. And actually those are the points you often will want to press, what I call the baffling points or the points of cognitive dissonance within his own worldview. Or when he sees things that, that, that amaze him from the Christian worldview. I mean, can't you imagine what the thief on the cross, we often talk about this, but what did he hear Jesus say? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He knew Jesus didn't deserve to be there, that he did. And you can imagine he's hanging there thinking, who does that? I'm not going to say that. I damn all these people. I don't want them forgiven. What is he, who is this man? He's not like any earthly man. No, he just told Pilate, I'm a king, but not like any king you know anything about. <laughs> I come from heaven. I'm not of this world. I come into this world and I have a great impact on this world. The greatest ever, but it's not from this world. So, the, you can say to the unbeliever, on the other hand, uh, when you answer a fool according to his folly, you can say, let me come into your world, talk about your world, I'll show you, we'll talk about your naturalistic, atheistic presuppositions, and 
really talk about how you can't maintain the things that you, you even want in your worldview. You want logic or, or beauty or love. None of that stuff makes any sense. And again, you say, well, you have to demonstrate all that. Well, of course, we have several courses here where we do that. I'm just setting it out. I'm assuming a lot of you know these things. Um, but there's, there's a, Greg would, would very carefully lay all of this out. Well, one way that he would love to especially apply that, we don't really have the time to do that, I'm just going to kind of mention it, is in the question of the problem of evil. Uh, Greg would often get into that. And that, I, I mentioned that problem, I mentioned one in many earlier, but the problem of evil is arguably the chief things people raise as an objection. Is some form of the problem of evil. And you could state the problem this way. If God is all-powerful, all-good, how can there be evil in the world? By the way, Scott Christensen uh, has a book with PNR that, that is, is, is arguing along lines of, of this sort. He has a book called What About Evil? A Defense of God's Sovereign Glory. That was a PNR book published just a couple of years ago. Uh, it's a pretty good, pretty good book. Uh, but Archibald MacLeish, if you know his play JB, which is about Job, says this, he encapsulates it nicely. He says, if God is good, he is not God. If God is God, he is not good. Uh, that's sort of the, what the believer says. In other words, if, if evil becomes a defeater for God. So here are some of the basic non-theistic approaches to the problem of evil. Atheism says there's evil and thus there's no God. Evil is a defeater for the Christian God, they say. Pantheism, of course, Hinduism, Buddhism, says there's God but there's no evil. If you don't know about that, you can study that and understand why monism does that. Because everything is one. So there's not good and evil. There's, everything is one, radically so. Uh, panentheism says evil is a necessary part of the ongoing progress of the interaction of God in the world. That's process, philosophy, and theology. Greg did some stuff with that in some of his work. Finite godism, some call it, which is the God who risks. God desires to destroy evil but lacks power. Openness, openness theology. Uh, Greg Boyd and John Sanders and Clark Pinnock. These are supposed uh, evangelicals who are arguing that God doesn't really ordain all that comes to pass and doesn't even know it, really. Hmm, that's comforting, I'm told. Not to me, it isn't. Uh, and then you have somewhere between that, if you remember like Harold Kushner's, it's somewhere between that position, the, the old why bad things happen to good people. That was, for, for many people, that was a seminal book. Uh, and his answer is what Ann Richards of Texas used to say about George Herbert Walker Bush. Uh, he can't help it. When he was born with a silver foot in his mouth, she said about him. And he says these things and he can't help it. And that's basically what Kushner is saying about God. Bad things happen, he can't help it. You know, he's, he's suffering along with you. But I don't, do you find it terribly comfort just to think God's suffering along with you? Um, he's not, he's running the world. Praise God for his glory and our good, and those things come together. His elect's well-being is as is, I couldn't, I wouldn't dare say that they come together and that our well-being is so at his heart, he's willing to spare his son and his son's willing to come in the spirits. God does all, I couldn't ask him to do what he does. You couldn't either, I mean, it would be audacious. This is, I mean, you know, we complain about God, oh, evil, and it's like, He's so gracious, what are you talking about? Uh, the Christian theistic approach is to say, well, there's evil, yes. Uh, God, the God of the Bible, is all good and all powerful. This can be a problem not just for the unbeliever, but for believers as well. Psalm 73, why do the wicked prosper? That's a believer struggling with seeing this. The origin of evil is an all-powerful, all-good God created creatures. Adam was able to sin and able not to sin. They sinned. Thus the origin of evil in humanity in this world. You say, well, we believe in God decreeing all that come to pass, but He's not the author of sin. If you want to say, well, rationally He is. Well, rationality is not the basis. This is the basis. This says He's not. James 1, end of argument. He's not the author of sin. Um, and Greg would answer this challenge in a Proverbs 26, 4 and 5 way. Uh, 26.4, answer a fool not according to his folly. We can demonstrate from, demonstrate from Scripture. You can think of Romans 9 uh, where it talks about he makes some vessels for honor and others for dishonor, that God has a sufficient reason for the evil that exists in the world. I heard Greg was the first person I ever heard say that. I remember that, that so grabbed me, has a sufficient uh, reason for evil that exists. And I thought, wow, he's, he, he was so unashamed of his Lord. 
Oh my, do we need that? Oh, do we need that? The presence of evil becomes, and we can say this to our people and to unbelievers, the presence of evil becomes the occasion for the fullest manifestation of God's glory, the salvation of the elect to the glory of God's mercy and grace, the damnation of the reprobate to the glory of God's wrath and justice. And you say, well, there's a lot of Christians that don't like that. Yeah, but that's, the Bible teaches it. They just have to come to terms with it. You don't get to say, oh, I believe in the Bible. If I'm, I'm gonna, good, I'll bring everything up it teaches. Why should I be embarrassed to do that? You're telling me you believe in it. It says it right there. You know, we, we get, you know, we, we got to get them in. I have friends who say, we got to get them in the front door, kind of in an Arminian way. And then in the back room, we'll give them this Calvinism. They never get around to it, in my opinion. I've never seen anybody. It could, it's bait and switch. And, and people stay at a church by what brought them in. Not, you know, you don't come in and then, you know, huh, let's tell you the real story here. Kind of lacks integrity. Hmm. This wouldn't be the case without evil. This doesn't make evil necessary, but rather, listen, the occasion for God to demonstrate He's so great and good that evil can't defeat Him. In fact, He's so great and so good that He uses evil. It isn't just that it doesn't defeat Him. He uses evil to bring about the greatest good, Calvary. God's defeat of evil by using the forces of evil is the breathtaking truth proclaimed in the apostolic preaching of the cross. Because he's so great, he's so good, that he uses arguably the worst thing ever where we took with wicked hands and put to death the Lord of glory. He uses that which appears to be and the forces of the enemy rejoice. And it's in that very moment that he lands the decisive blow, snatches victory from the jaws of defeat because in his death we see the death of death and our triumph. And that's all made manifest in his resurrection. This is what we've achieved. So this is all part of our dealing with the question and problem of evil. This is the Christian way of dealing with it. This is not answering the fool. And you say, well, should we say this to believers, unbelievers? Say it to anybody. To believers, for their encouragement to unbelievers, this is our view and understanding. You, you ask, I understand it's not yours. You, you can stop interrupting me and telling me it's not yours. I won't interrupt me when you tell me yours. But this is our view. I'm, I'm not going to just do something to please you. I'm not going to try to change God to make Him fit more friendly and comfortably with you. You have to, you have to fit Him. He doesn't have to fit you. <laughs> this, isn't, this isn't the way it works. You know? So Greg would often then also say, um, there's a lot more I could say here. Um, we could say, don't atheists, like all humans, though, offer sympathy for close friends who have suffered or, or, you know, who are suffering or have suffered? Yes, due to common grace, but not consistent with their worldview. It's the atheist who denies God and affirms the reality of evil who has the problem. Because if you deny God, you have no way to account for evil. How in an atheistic, naturalistic, uh, materialistic world can there be a moral judgment about evil? There can only be at best preferences. You don't like something, Okay. No way to say that something that one objects to or dislikes is wrong. We can. We can say these things that they say it's horrible that, that children should be sold into sexual slavery. I have friends in Cambodia who are working in this, working against this. this is hor there are horrible things happening in the world. We could just go down the list. And we, can, we know they're horrible. We call them horrible. And we say Christ came to redeem us from this. Christ came to save you out of these horrible lifestyles. But you see, unbelievers don't live this way, do they? They pronounce things wrongs all, wrong all the time. Especially in the last few years. Boy, they're vicious with it, what they think is wrong. I mean, cancel culture certainly is not something that doesn't have an opinion about right and wrong. Sort of the gig is up. I mean, everybody's a moralist. It's just by what standard, by what morals. It's no longer respectable for neo-Darwinists openly to be social Darwinists, though that is the only ethic that makes sense in a Darwinian, neo-Darwinian world. Every Darwinist should be a social Darwinist, but they're not because they realize it's despicable. It led to the ovens. It led to the gulag. This is what it led to with, with Marx, with Darwin, 
This is where it leads. This is where the world leads. Show the fool that in denying God because there's evil, he renders himself incapable of rationally affirming that there is such a thing as evil. Yet he knows there is because he's been made in God's image, the truth of which he ever suppresses and deceives himself about while doing so. So Greg employed the twofold approach of an internal critique of unbelief and a vigorous defense of the faith firmly within the Christian worldview. You defend the Christian faith from within the Christian worldview. So you're saying, but what you're really talking about is preaching the gospel. That's right. Evangelism is our primary task. And when people raise objections, we engage in apologetics. So when the Philippian jailer comes in and says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Paul does not say, wait a minute, we've got to talk about Plato first. I, I, he gives them the gospel. We give the gospel to people. Well, isn't apologetics pre-evangelism? No. No. It's not pre-evangelism. It's part of evangelism. Some people don't need that particularly. The Lord's prepared them. They're ready to hear. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. They're ready to hear that. Not, well, uh, wait a minute. Now, do you believe in the resurrection? Let me prove that to you. Just notice Paul's apologetics. He does it beautifully, beautifully in Acts. So Greg uh, employed this twofold approach an internal critique of unbelief and a vigor vigorous defense of the faith within the Christian worldview, unashamedly using God's special revelation to do so. His genius was to consistently hold the field while many were abandoning it at some point, appealing to epistemological common ground, failing to press the claims of King Jesus, Psalm 2, that Greg always boldly and clearly pressed. We can thank God for the life and work of such a servant who was truly Valiant for truth. That's one that always comes to mind for me. The Bunyan character. Valiant for truth. This defensor fidei, defender of the faith, was not, uh, was not with us long enough for our satisfaction, but in his remarkable 47 years, he was with us just as God intended. And he's left a remarkable apologetic legacy for us to follow and to build upon as the wise man who built his house, not on the shifting sands of human opinion, but on the solid rock of the ontological trinity and the self-attesting Christ of Scripture. Greg has left a legacy of clarity with laypersons and profundity with scholars, including debating and defeating anti-theistic opponents. His work, is self, his work in self-deception and his apologetic sharpening and use of certain scriptures like Proverbs 26, 4 and 5 has played a key role for many who have succeeded him and who seek to labor faithfully as did he. His approach was supremely useful, not merely abstract and theoretical, and thus needed more than ever in these dark days. He set a great example of apologetic faithfulness in an era of compromise. And remember what the... When I say these dark days, we think of that post tenebras lux, the great uh, motto of Calvin's academy, after the darkness light. Don't give up, brothers. Press on. Press on. Because King Jesus will triumph. May God give us grace, likewise to be faithful now and in the coming years, treasuring and expanding the legacy that Greg Bonson has left us. Amen.